If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater Ministries. I'm pleased to introduce to my audience a dear brother in the Lord, Richard Bennett, Director of Berean Beacon Ministries, an outreach to Roman Catholics. It is great to be here, Larry. For people that don't know you, you were a Roman Catholic priest for 22 years. Is that right? Please give us a short account of your life. Yes, I was a Catholic priest for 22 years. I was a Catholic altogether for 48 years, having grown up in Dublin, Ireland. I was trained uh, very early on in my education, in what we call secondary and elementary education, uh, by the Jesuits. And then I decided to become a Catholic priest, and I spent eight years uh, in preparation. It was a novitiate year, and then six years to ordination when I was ordained a priest in Dublin, Ireland in 1963, and then one year in Rome, eight years in all. Then I spent uh, 21 years in uh, Trinidad, West Indies as a parish priest carrying out the the work of a priest. I had the best academic training you could get finishing up in the city of Rome itself near the Vatican. And I, I really had a desire to bring P- Catholics to uh, what we thought was a way of being right with God so that they could get to purgatory and then that they finally could get to heaven. And I was great for doing penances and sacrifices. And then I was very devout in Trinidad, uh, uh, baptizing babies, hearing people's confessions and doing all the sacraments. It was in 1972, I had a very serious accident where I was three days unconscious after the serious accident and then after that time when I got out of the hospital in the sanatorium I began searching in the Bible for what is true. It took me 14 years of comparing the Bible to Catholicism before I realized that I was dead in trespasses and sins and it was by grace alone that we are saved. I One night I got on the floor in my house and I cried out to God for faith and his grace to save a wretch like me, dead in trespass and sins, and he gloriously did that. It was about two months afterwards. I very reluctantly left the Catholic Church because my prayer after I was right with God by biblical salvation was that I could really love Catholics and give them the real true gospel of grace. That is grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone. But then in prayer over those two months after I was saved, the Lord showed me that I could best serve him and love Catholics if I left actually the priesthood and the Catholic Church and reached out to Catholics nonetheless. And um, I I did that. I left uh, the priesthood in 1985 and uh, reached the States in 1986. And uh, I, um, I just prayed and prayed that I would have a love for Catholics to reach out. I thank the Lord that after one year as a missionary in China, I was able to start the ministry that I now have called BereanBeacon.org. It is to show Catholics the real truth of where salvation is in a person, not in any church. And it is by God's grace, not by any ritual that any church does. So this has been really wonderful. I've seen priests save. I saw two priests in Poland, you know, through our ministry. We have a Polish webpage besides many other languages and of course in English 
and I thank God that I have seen God's grace poured out and that is my heart's desire, Larry, that Catholics would know the truth and that evangelicals in this very false ecumenical age would see the differences. Uh, I have a very interesting article on the webpage, uh, Are Catholics Christians? And we've had tremendous response to that, evangelicals whose eyes have been opened in reading that article. So it's with love for Catholics and to show the truth of Christ Jesus, that God will be glorified and many, many souls saved, particularly Catholics, to the glory of his name. Outstanding. That was a wonderful testimony, Richard. Uh, could you just real briefly tell us about, uh, you've written some books and you've already mentioned your ministry, but what are these books you've written and how can people find them? Yes, I have written or uh, edited, uh, written some and edited others and uh, they have been amazing. I just thank God. Uh, our most well-known book is Far From Rome, Near to God, The Testimonies of 50 Converted Catholic Priests. Since 1994, that book has sold steadily across the world in English and in other languages. And uh, it's on the third edition now. And uh, the other book that has my heart really displayed and my love for Catholics is the book I've written about Catholicism called Catholicism East of Eden Insights into Catholicism for the 21st Century. This book is uh, published by Banner of Truth Trust, like the uh, book of the 50 testimonies of former priests. And um, I thank God for that because the Lord has used that book and it brought many Catholics to himself by that book. Uh, the other book that my heart was in, in editing, together with Mary Hertel, is a book called The Truth Set Us Free, 20 Former Nuns Tell Their Stories. And that book has been used mightily of the Lord as well. And I thank God for the, those women, most of whom are still alive and active in reaching out to Catholics themselves. And it is just a wonderful testimony of God's grace. And the the other book I've written is called On the Wings of Grace Alone. I've edited that, and that is just 30 ordinary Catholics and uh, what we call lay Catholics and how the Lord brought them to salvation. That is a, an amazing book too. How can you obtain these books? Well, go to our webpage, bereanbeacon.org, and just go to the folder on the left-hand side, Books, and when you click on that, it gives all the details of how you can get those books. Outstanding. Well, Richard, uh, we're going to go into uh, showing people your videos now here across uh, particularly our audience on YouTube. But uh, many people don't know that you and me go to the same church here in Austin, Texas. So it gives me a special opportunity to be around you a lot just so we can do ministry work. But anyway, I want to thank you for allowing us to post your videos uh, on the Internet through YouTube and other Internet servers. You praise God and may souls be saved and the Lord glorified. Amen and amen. Amen. I call this address identifying the early church. We can identify and see clearly what the early believers held to dearly and what they exalted in the gospel of Christ. And that is our topic. We have to see that the early believers were emphatic on what the authority was, what was the basis of truth, what they held to be the final, absolute, unbreakable standard. In the time after the apostles, when the apostles had died, that is the period of time called the post-apostolic age, we had a group of preachers and teachers uh, they were known as the post-apostolic fathers. They were the pastors and teachers. And they were emphatic on what was the authority they were holding to. 
they continually quoted only from the scriptures. And so some of the most famous of these, to mention their names, such as Ignatius, Polycarp, Clement, Barnabas, and the writings in the Didache. I had the great privilege one time actually to go to where Polycarp had preached and taught but when I traveled in that part of the world. But these were outstanding men who knew that it was the truth of scripture that that could not be broken or gainsayed as Christ Jesus himself had said the scripture cannot be broken. They defended the faith and they preached the true gospel of God's grace. They preached salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and in the person of Christ Jesus. And they praised and they exalted the person of Christ Jesus the Lord. These post-apostolic fathers. We had at the earliest times also those called the apologists defending Christianity and the true gospel message against the pagans. And there are many of these, but probably the most famous are Justin Martyr and Athenagoras. In them also, like in the post-apostolic teachers and preachers, the exclusive appeal is to scripture as the authority. And it's the true gospel of God's grace through faith that is upheld. Now, it is in the late or maybe to the mid-2nd century, so we're call, talking about like 150 AD, 160, around about this very early period that we get the first mention in Christian writing of what was called apostolic tradition. Mentioning of a oral tradition that was preached. And this is the first mention in the mid to late second century. And men like Irenaeus and Tertullian who represent a lot of these um, writings at the time, they are emphatic that apostolic tradition is simply teaching that is in line with scripture. Otherwise, it's not apostolic tradition. <laughs> so apostolic tradition means what was handed down and is in line with scripture. So it's not something that is an independent source or that is in any way contradicting scripture. Apostolic tradition is in what is in teaching with the teaching of the apostles as it was written down. And they are quite emphatic on that such as Tertullian and Irenaeus. It was Irenaeus that said that the apostles, first of all, spoke orally, and later their teachings were put down in writing, but we have the scriptures, and this became, in the words of Irenaeus, the church's pillar and ground of truth. Again, the scripture is the final authority. Now, from the very earliest days of Christendom, the four Gospels were read in different churches. They had it in different forms, like scrolls and writings, but the four Gospels were read and known among the believers. And the writings of the Apostle Paul and of Peter were known even while these men still lived. They circulated. That's how early. So a substantial amount of what we now know as the New Testament, was available even while the apostles lived. Certainly in the apostle John's time, who was the last of the apostles to go to the Lord, we had a substantial part of the New Testament with John's own writing, finally, of course, of the book of Revelation, after he had given us the wonderful gospel of John. 
So these writings were accepted by the early believers as inspired written word scripture because the spirit of God which indwelt them verified to their spirit that this was the actual word of God and that they knew that they had received just as the Apostle Paul had said before, they could quote what the Apostle Paul had said, received it not as the words of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. <laughs> Praise God. They knew that they had in their hands the word of God. Now, there were controversies about some individual books as they came to define what the canon of Scripture is. You know what I mean by the canon? That is the number of books. What exactly are the names of the books in the New Testament? There was a dispute about one or two of the books, or three of the books. There was a, a dispute, but this controversy quickly ended. And what we now know as the New Testament was widely held from earliest times. Well over a hundred years or more before the full list was written out. We had a full list written out at the local council of Hippo in 393 and Carthage in 397, but many, many, many years before that. We find in the writings of the early Christians, they're quoting from all the books of the New Testament as we now know it. For example, Justin Martyr, born in or about the year 100, and who died in and about... 165. He was the earliest Christian apologist whose works survive. In his dialogue with Trifo, he wrote, quotation, it was not by reason of circumcision that Abraham was justified of God to be righteous, but on account of faith. For before he was circumcised, it was said of him, Abraham believed in God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. End of quotation from Justin Martyr. And Clement of Rome, who died about the year 100, and he may have worked, it's quite likely, with the Apostle Paul, he wrote his own epistle to the Corinthians. He stated, quotation, Therefore, we also being called through his, God's will, in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves, neither through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works, but through faith. End of quotation from Clement of Rome. And Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, he was born about the year 69 and he died a martyr about the year 155. He wrote, quotation, The Lord Jesus Christ in whom you believe, knowing that through grace ye are saved, not from works, but by the will of God, through Jesus Christ. End of quotation from Polycarp. And Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp, who died about the year 190 or as late as the year 202, in his writings called in Latin adversus heresies, against heresies, he wrote, quotation, for as through the disobedience of one man who first was fashioned out of rude earth, many were made sinners and forfeited life. So it was necessary also that through the obedience of one man who first was born from the Virgin, many sh should be justified and receive salvation. Irenaeus also gave a clear description of justification by faith based on the righteousness of Christ Jesus when he wrote, quotation, When Christ came, he accomplished all things and still in the church continues to accomplish the New Testament foretold by the law. 
even to consummation. As also the Apostle Paul says in his epistle to the Romans, but now without the law, the righteousness of God is manifested, being testified by the law and the prophets. For the just shall live by faith, but that the just shall live by faith had been foretold by the prophets. End of this second quotation from Irenaeus. Athanasius in the 4th century wrote in the comment on the epistle to the Romans, he stated, quotation, not from these, but from faith, a man is justified, as also was Abraham. Having thus discussed such points, the apostle shows again that in no other manner can there be redemption and grace to Israel and to the Gentiles except the original sin which through Adam passed unto all be loosed. But this, says he, can be blotted out though no other than through the Son of God. For it was impossible that any other should lose this transgression. Thus, through one man sin entered into the world. Thus also, through one man, grace came upon all. End of quotation from Athanasius. An extensive documentation of quotations from the early church is found in such books as the Doctrine of Justification and an Outline of its History in the Church and its Exposition from Scripture by James Buchanan, published in 1867, and the Primitive Doctrine of Justification, investigated by George Stanley Faber, published in 1837. It's remarkable to see this. They knew the authority of Scripture. They had a love for the Lord. They saw the Lord had embodied revelation and his his embodied revelation in the New Testament was final authoritative and they knew the gospel of God's grace. Praise God, we look forward to eternity as we would share the life to come with these men and women who knew the gospel and the truth of the scriptures from the earliest times. Now there was severe persecution by the Roman emperors, but particularly Rome itself, where the Christians suffered most. But the heroic lives of the preachers, many of whom gave their lives for the gospel besides preaching the gospel, and the heroic lives of the men and women who lived for the gospel and died for the gospel is remarkable. Particularly under the, the emperor Diocletian and his co-regent that was from 303 to um, 311. That was probably the most severe of all the persecutions. Uh, we had the beginning under Septimus Severus, who died in 211, but we had horrendous suffering, torture and death of the believers, and they stood strong. And far from exterminating the gospel, it grew. God's people grew in grace and wisdom and knowledge and love of the Lord. Now, there were some of the believers who left Rome and the vicinity, and they left to go to northern Italy and to move towards southern France. That's in the Alpine area between Italy and France. And these believers were known as the Vaudois, and they are the most famous of the early church for their loyalty and love for Christ Jesus and the gospel and their fidelity to the scriptures and their authentic moral life 
in agriculture and in the way they upheld themselves, the men, women, children. It was remarkable. The, there's many, many accounts of the, of the Vaudois. We have some with us, but there's many, many accounts with, that you can read. Uh, one of them is, is uh, George Stanley Faber, and he gives this account of how the Vaudois moved to this uh, area, what is called the Cotian, C-O-T-T-I-A-N, Alps, that is the Alps as they are between Italy and France. And they set up their farms, their homesteads there, and lived really biblical lives for many centuries. They knew that they went back to the original form of Christianity that had been preached by the apostles. And they were authentic to this. Now, I want you to be clear because the Vaudois are sometimes called by another name. They're sometimes called Waldenses. And you'll find books about the Vaudois and the name on the cover says Waldenses. Now, this is because one of their most famous preachers for many centuries after they started, Peter Waldo from Lyon in France, because of his name, uh, uh, Peter Waldo, he gave the name, they became known as Waldenses. He was the famous man who led a team of many famous preachers that went across different parts of Europe. But they are the same group, even though they have different names. And sometimes people call them the Vaudois, sometimes they call them the Waldenses, but it's the same group. Um, different people have written about, about them. The famous David of Augsburg calls the Vaudois successors of the apostles. They are in possession of apostolic authority and the keys to bind and unbind. Theodore Beza, the famous reformer in the 16th century, voices the same sentiment. I'd like to read Beza's exact words. As for the Waldenses, I may be permitted to call them the very seed of the primitive and pure Christian church, since they are those who have upheld, as is abundantly manifest, so that neither those endless storms and tempests by which the whole Christian world has been shaken for so many succeeding ages and the Western part so miserably oppressed by the Bishop of Rome, falsely so-called, nor those horrible persecutions which have been expressly raised against them were able so far to prevail, to make them bend or yield voluntary subjection to the Roman tyranny and idolatry, end of quotation. And so Beza, like so many other famous writers and historians, sees the Vaudois, the Waldenses, as a very primitive seed of the early church. It wasn't just that part of the Alps. They moved out many places to evangelize. They were famous for their evangelism and how they moved out to other territories right across Europe. The Vaudois lived Christian lives, moral lives, and they were known for their evangelistic zeal in exalting the gospel of Christ Jesus. They were those who loved the scriptures, and they emphatically loved the scriptures. They were so precise that they knew that they had to have the scriptures in the authentic translation from the correct Greek text, what we would call the textus receptus, the text that the believers had always received, and they would not have any corrupt text from which they took their translation. Quite interesting. Not only a love for Christ, but they wanted the written word of God authentically given. And there were some of the men, women, and children who had memorized whole books of the Bible. Young people, listen. Some of those young people knew the word and could quote the word. And, of course, the preachers were famous. They were, stood on the principle that men had a right to preach the gospel. And they were emphatic in standing on 
principles of the Lord and such as the Sermon on the Mount and spoke against the rejection of oaths. They condemned purgatory and other Roman Catholic practices. They talked about after death there was just two places to go to heaven or hell and it depend on hearing the gospel of Christ Jesus. They did not accept idols or imagery or mysticism in any sort of ways. And so when we have such as McLaren and Tony Jones and Alan Jones and others going back to imagery and they call ancient Christian practices, they were not found among the Vaudois. The Vaudois, Waldenses condemned them. And they were emphatic, and it's amazing because they wrote out their statements of faith. As they were persecuted under Rome, and many of them died under torture in the 605 years of the Roman Catholic brutal inquisition, and many of them were burnt at the stake, they were emphatic that the man of sin of 2 Thessalonians 2 and that the Antichrist of Revelation 17 and 18 is the papal system. They were quite clear on who the man of sin is, the son of perdition. And they should know because they knew the scriptures and they lived underneath his tyrannical rule. Who we'll try, just read, say something like Wiley's history of the Waldenses to see how they were brutally oppressed, even in those higher regions of the Alps where the Romans went after them, the Roman Catholic massacring armies, sometimes burning whole parts of villages and caves where they hid men, women, and children. It's, it's really, really sad to read the history of the Vaudois, but they understood scripture, the gospel, they understood who the Christ was and exalted him, and they understood who the Antichrist was. Now, quite interesting, too, is the fact that we have another group that is quite similar. They claim to go back to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, but historically they really go back to the 7th century, but they had the name Paulicians, because of their love for the apostles Paul and his writings in the New Testament, they were called Paulicians. It looks like they were founded and started in what is now modern Turkey, but they suffered great persecution there, uh, for example, under the Emperor Constantine Bogontus, who issued a decree against them in 684. He did not obliterate them, they still increased and numbers and power and gave the gospel. Another ruler there, uh, Empress Theodora, tried again to obliterate them and wipe them out in 842, did not succeed. Many of them died for the very gospel they preached. But these Paulicians had moved particularly to southern France, where they became extremely well established. And the name came changed because of the region. They were now in Albigense country, around where the modern city is of Albi in France. But all around that southern part of France were the Albigenses. They were known for their agriculture, for their moral life, for the gospel, for the love of Christ Jesus, and their authenticity of the scriptures, as their authority and the true gospel of Christ. A remarkable people. It's with real sadness that we account their history. We have this on our DVD, more detail with some pictures are called the DVD on the Inquisition. But it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because it was in 1203 that Innocent III, the Pope of Rome, sent the armies of the papal Rome that had been part of the crusade now turned them against these believers and massacred their cities where a torrent of blood and so were their fields and their farms. 
They were massacred and obliterated. That was the beginning of the papal bloody torture and inquisition that was to go on for 605 years. It began with the Albigenses being wiped out. They were nearly, to the, of what we know historically, totally wiped out. There's no sign of them anymore. It is really sad. And not only were they wiped out, but Roman Catholic historians have tried to wipe out their memory by calling them Manichaeans, you know, who were Judas, and they've called them all sorts of things that they were not. They were true Christians. So the Catholic Church not only wiped them out, but has tried to tarnish their, their credibility. <laughs> I would to God that some young man at university would do a PhD and write a, write a book on the true history of the, of the, the Albigenses. There is so much there that could be researched and written on. It is a remarkable story of true men. I'd like to read from the secular historian Gibbon. We all know that book, and you should have it on your bookshelf at home, The Fall and Decline of the Roman Empire. He writes in page 398, quotation, The visible assemblies of the Paulicians of Albigois were exterminated by fire, by sword, and the bleeding remnant escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity. In the state and in the church and even in the cloister, a latent succession was preserved of the apostles of St. Paul, who protested against the tyranny of Rome, embraced the Bible as the rule of faith, and purified their creed from all visions of Gnostic theology. Interesting, even the secular historian Gibbon notices that the Paulicians, the Albigenses from Albigua, they given them the French name, didn't accept Gnosticism. They did not accept that you could have direct contact with God. Mysticism or Gnostic theology, they denounced that. So we have the the remarkable Albigenses who were wiped out by papal Rome. The, the Church of Rome increased nonetheless, and it was, I uh, beg your pardon, the, church of, uh, the true church increased, and it was spread throughout the world. It, it's fascinating to see the, the true church increase and multiply. There's books written on the expansion into Asia, and I was really, really pressed. How can I summarize this? And I give a summary that's by the historian Motef, as he gives a summary of the expansion into Asia. Quotation, before the end of the first century, the Christian faith broke out across the borders of Rome into Asian Asia. Its roots may have been as far away as India or as near as Edessa, just across the Euphrates. From Edessa, the faith spread to another small kingdom 300 miles further east across the Tigris River, near ancient Nineveh. By the end of the second century, missionary expansion carried the church as far east as Bactria, which is now northern Afghanistan. And mass conversions of Huns and Turks in Central Asia were reported from the 5th century onwards. By the end of the 7th century, Persian missionaries had reached the end of the world, the capital of Tiang Dynasty in China. Just a short summary of the expansion of the true gospel, upholding the true scriptures right across Asia. In my own Ireland, the gospel was embedded quite early. Patrick from Scotland, with many associates, preachers, set out and landed in Ireland in the year 405, the earliest part of the 5th century. So quite early on, we have 
Christianity coming to Ireland. Patrick had the true doctrines of God's grace based on scripture alone. There are two authentic documents from his hand written in Latin. His testimony called the Confession of Patrick we have in many manuscripts and his letter to Caroticus, both in his own hand and they're emphatic talking about what grace is, saving sinners like himself. He starts both documents by calling himself a sinner, but saved by grace. He is a remarkable evangelist who went to preach the gospel in Ireland, 405. For 60 years, in the length and breadth of Ireland, he established churches. And we have some of those now. You can actually see the physical churches. We're making a DVD where we'll actually show you photographs of some of these churches of Pat, where Patrick had established in Ireland. It is reckoned that by the end of his days, 60 is a long time to minister, there were established 365 churches across Ireland. And these churches were preaching the true gospel. They were coming against pagan religion in what was known as the Druids. The Druids are quite interesting people because they were mystics. <laughs> they said that you could have direct contact with God and the spirits. It wasn't just one God, but spirits. You could have direct contact, and they had pagan priests to do it, druid priests. Patrick, the evangelist, preached against them, sometimes ferocious attacks from the druids and their followers. But they succeeded in converting most of the island. And not only in those 60 years but for 707 years after Patrick. Ireland was known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars because they sent out missionaries right across Europe and they founded monasteries. Now the monasteries were where men came aside to study the scriptures for a certain amount of years, memorize scripture, know the authority of scripture and the true gospel and then go out and preach. They were not monasteries in the Catholic sense of looking to some rituals or inner holiness. <laughs> they were looking to Christ Jesus for holiness of life and conduct. So, interesting place, interesting monasteries. They were very much like the Vaudois had similar monasteries. I did not mention that, but they had monasteries too whereby men came aside to study the scriptures and then later on married and had families. But interesting, the Isle of Saints and Scholars. And we had many famous men going out. I'd like to mention a few of them. Columba, who went to Iona and then went to evangelize Scotland. I was speaking recently to some of the historians in Scotland. I was speaking to them on the telephone, and they were saying that some of their roots go back to Columba, the Irish missionary. The roots of true biblical faith went back to the missionary Columba, who set out for Scotland in the year 563. Columbanus, very famous as a missionary, went out to... Uh, evangelized France and Germany in 612. Why was he famous? Particularly because he not only gave the true gospel, but he withstood the papal church, an infant baptism. He preached believers' baptism, as it did all the early church. And the true gospel. So Columbanus is known for his stand even against the papal church besides preaching the true gospel. Killian and his brothers set out for Franconia and Walsburg in 680, and Fornanan and 12 brothers set out to bring the gospel to the Belgium uh, frontier in 970. There were 707 years of fidelity 
It breaks my heart because my roots and my, my birth go back to Ireland. Because that biblical faith was obliterated from Ireland. It was planned by a pope, Adrian IV, in 1155. He not only planned it, but he wrote to the king of England, Henry II. And he told him that he was to put together an army and invade Ireland, take over the princedoms and the kingdoms, bring it all under England, and bring the churches under the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't done in that year, 1155. It was put into operation in 1171, and it was finished in 1172. 1172, the famous, famous Council of Cashel called the, the different pastors and teachers from the different churches, and they were to submit under pain of death to the papal church. It is really sad to see how the Roman church, together with armies from England under Henry II, brought an end to biblical faith. Now, there still is biblical faith in Southern Ireland even, and Northern Ireland in particular, but for the most part, that persecution was successful. It is terribly sad because of the heritage of Patrick that spread across Europe. Some even secular historians talk about the civilization of Europe that came with the gospel that went out from Ireland. Now, most interesting of all, and we've only barely touched on it, was the Church of Rome. What was the Church of Rome? The Church of Rome, from the earliest days, knew the gospel. And it is amazing that um, the Apostle Paul, who is very strict on the gospel and brings many churches to their heel or to the authority of Scripture and the true gospel, he praises the Church of Rome. He starts off in chapter 1 saying, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world as God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. He praised the believers. Who were the believers? The believers are those who met in the home churches. They did not have church buildings. They had pastors true to the gospel and the scriptures, preaching the gospel in different congregations around the city of Rome. And Paul writes to them and praises them for their fidelity. Historically, we know for a fact that they were faithful to the true gospel for 250 years, under some of the persecutions I already mentioned, some of the more deadly ones under, like Nero, where Christians were put to, to make, like, burning lanterns, at this, burnt at stakes to, at the Forum and at the Colosseum, and put to, to death by wild beasts and all other horrendous things under Nero. But... There were horrendous tortures and deaths against them, and they stood strong. They were very conscious of what the Lord Jesus Christ said. One is your Lord and Master, and ye are all brethren. There were men who acted as pastors and teachers, but they were part of the brotherhood of believers, it's because there's only one Lord and Master, and he's the Christ. It would be unthinkable to them to have a hierarchy with a pontiff sitting on top in his robes and his mitre who has underneath him cardinals and underneath cardinals archbishops and under them bishops and under them priests and under them lay people. That would be unthinkable. And to look to rituals to save people and infant baptism to make people Christian, it would be unthinkable. So the utter contrast between what was there in those 250 years from earliest Christian times 
to what later became the Church of Rome is one of the most stark contrasts in history. Scripture had prophesied it, but it happened in Rome where from the believers there rose up apostasy and infidelity. It really began when the persecutions ended in the year 313. There were two emperors in the west, Constantine and Lucinius in the east, and they declared together what was called the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan is interesting. People may know about it. They say that's when Christianity was first of all recognized. Yes, but that's when paganism was again recognized. Paganism is recognized and Christianity. And that's where the cancer of paganism begins to seep into what was the Christian world. Constantine himself was, for the most part, responsible for what was to become the hierarchy. He had in his empire four different vice regents who ruled for him in different parts of the empire. So he thought that the Christian church should have four distinctive territories and that over them should be patriarchs and that they should be called dioceses, the word that is still used in modern Catholicism. So he set up Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Rome as the four main centers where there would be a main man called a patriarch who would look over the pastors and teachers for that area. This was the beginning of setting up an institution instead of believers with a pastor preaching the gospel. And the temptation was because people respected a pastor, an elder because of the importance of a city, that the pastor or teacher in Rome, the main pastor, should be respected with more honor because Rome was the principal city. It was the king of cities in the whole empire. Therefore, the, the bishop of Rome, the chief bishop or teacher of Rome, should be the chief bishops or teachers of the Christian faith. And different pastors from different areas began to recognize and give respect to the Church of Rome. And at this time, now we're talking about the 4th, 5th centuries, the gospel is gone. And for the most part, infant baptism is coming in, where they look to a person being born again as water is poured over them. And ceremonialism is taken over from the gospel. Its rituals are now not the gospel of God's grace. And we become to a stage where it's no longer called elders or pastors. They start calling people priests. And that they are mediating things to the people, spiritual things, by rituals that they call sacraments. And so we have this watering down of the gospel or losing the gospel at the same time. By the 5th century, in 440, we had a famous bishop of Rome called Leo I. He assumed that he had influence over all of Western Christianity, and he claimed to have influence. And it was with the moving of the seat of the emperor from Rome to Constantinople, that the Pope, who was to become a Pope, he was still just Bishop of Rome, that his authority increased. Why? Because at the same time, there was these barbarians coming down from the north to come into the, what was the empire and take over different regions. And they began to come into the different parts of what had been the Roman Empire. Now there was the emperors now in Constantinople 
and the man who is taking reins is the Bishop of Rome. And the authority, civil authority, is beginning to look like it's in his hands as well. So this plays into his power grip. And so it is that the, a lot of these early barbarians get converted to the type of Romanism that was being established, where the gospel was gone, infant baptism was established, and ceremonialism, and idolatry. This was coming in. It started off with France, and it was Clovis, the king of the Franks, who made a vow on the field of the battle as he defeated the Germans called the Alemanni, he made a vow that he would become a Christian. And he was baptized in the year 496 at the Cathedral of Reims. The Bishop of Rome called him the eldest son of the church, the title that they still call the France, the eldest son of the church. Then it was followed by the Burgundians of southern Gaul, the Visigoths of Spain, the Suevi of Portugal, and the Anglo-Saxons of, of Britain. These barbarians were converted to a Christianity that is not Christianity, to Roman Catholicism. They submitted to the Roman Catholic power. Now, there was great rivalry between the four patriarchs that I mentioned, but then when in 330, the emperor is now in Constantinople, the rivalry is between Constantinople and Rome, as who is the greatest. But this was solved for the most part in the year 606 when the emperor from Constantinople, Phocas, made a decree declaring the preeminence of the bishop of Rome and that he was the bishop to oversee all bishops. And he recognized that officially and civilly in the year 606. Interesting thing took place later in the 8th century. In the 8th century, the Catholic Church increasing in power and might and territorial uh, gain uh, was to present a document to the world at the time called the Donation of Constantine, that is the gift or the, of Constantine. It was a document made out to be written in the hand of Constantine to the Bishop of Rome, who was Sylvester in the year 335. It was a forgery. It was written in the Latin of the 8th century, claiming to be the Latin of the 4th century. And it was to set up power for the Roman church for many years. And it was to produce evil fruit as the Roman church is recognized now across much of what had been Christianity. People were bowing the knee to papal Rome. The famous, infamous forgery, the donation of Constantine, had borne fruit because the um, at the time of uh, Pepin in the palace in, in France, and, and Stephen, who was the Bishop of Rome, there was a real crisis in the world at that time. The crisis was that the Arians, who were some of the first heretics, the, denying the Trinity and the divinity of Christ, they were powerful and they had kings in Lombardy. And they were marching across Italy, even towards Rome itself. And the Muslims at the same time had overrun Spain and some of Africa. And they were going to march on Rome itself. So Stephen, the Pope, turns to the eldest son of, of, of uh, Rome, the so-called uh, uh, Christians of France, under Pepin who is in charge of the army. He's mayor of the palace. Pepin wants to do a coup d'etat. He wants power for himself. So he makes a deal with Stephen, the, the Pope. If, if you get recognize me as king, I will come in and defeat the Lombards. And that's the way the deal was. In actual fact, 
That's the way it happened. He crossed the Alps. He came in, came in, he destroyed the Aryans under their Lombard kings. He took possession of many cities right across Italy. And we had the beginning of the temporal power of the Roman church where they had physical territory. And the Pope is now civil ruler in many cities besides in Rome itself. That was the famous Pekin. He had a more famous son, and all of you young people should know his name, Charlemagne. If you don't know the name, well, you have to study history. Charlemagne was famous. He had conquered most of what we would now call the, the European countries. And he, on Christmas Eve, in the year 800, knelt before Pope Leo III, asking that he would recognize him as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And the Pope placed on his head a crown. And so the Pope became one to make kingdoms. The real sad turn of history. We had then from the 8th century going to 9th, 10th, 11th century, we have horrendous times because the papacy is now claiming power over kingdoms and princedoms. And at the same time, it becomes drunken with immorality. Some of the popes were in their teens. And the Vatican became an orgy for a lot of immorality that went on. At the same time, they're lording it over, claiming to be the head of Christianity. There were two centuries in which we had Theodora and Marosia, the two most infamous women in history. Some of their children were put on the so-called chair of Peter and ruled as popes. We had two horrendous centuries of immorality. Nonetheless, the Church of Rome claimed to be the true church. Now this is a, a real sad history of the, the Roman church. I just gave a very quick overview over to that time, you know, coming into the 10th, 11th centuries. And uh, it gets even bad right up into the 13th century. We'll see later on in the week. But it's... Um, under even Thomas Aquinas and later on some of the big intellects of Romanism and the immorality of Rome and the, the so-called Christianity that was preached. But it is really sad because they have deceived the world and they continue to deceive the world. And so many movements like the emerging church are running into the arms of Rome. The new perspective, urban theology, coming home movement, and we could go on and on. Evangelicals and Catholics together movement that started here in the United States in 1994. It's all bowing to Rome, bowing the knee to papal Rome. And when we even give an overview of its history, you'd wonder how anybody, not alone is their doctrine corrupt, but their morals and their teaching and their brutal inquisition of which they tortured and put to death believers. If, he, if a person even has an a overview of history, they would not be deceived by the deceptions of modern times. I'd like to give a quick summary of the beauty and wonder of the early church and what it was founded on. At the time when Christ Jesus came into the world, there were pagan religions. There was unity across the world, the known world at the time, because of the Roman Empire. But peace, civilly, but no peace in people's hearts. Immorality and horrendous standards of living. And then came the gospel of Christ Jesus. It changed Europe, it changed the world, it changed Asia. It changed the world. Christ Jesus came 
and preached everlasting life. And that life was found as people believed on him alone in the glory of the gospel based on the scriptures alone. It changed the world and brought in true Christianity in all those early years we spoke about. And with the vow to our going on for many, many centuries, it came into Africa, into Gaul, into Germany, into Britain, right across Europe and the Asian nations. It was the gospel of Christ Jesus. People embraced the gospel. They knew the authority of scripture. They knew that salvation was by God's grace through faith. They knew that salvation was not in any church or institution. It was in a person. And they gave praise and glory to Christ Jesus alone and emphatically denounced imagery and images and so-called direct contact with God, which was called mysticism. And so we have the wonder of the early Christian church. It is just remarkable because the unity expressed. The apostles wrote in their own day, the apostles and elders sent greetings unto the brethren. And that it was right through history. It was the brethren. They looked upon themselves as brothers and sisters in the Lord. It is amazing when we read of the reformers in the 16th century when some of the reformers discovered the Waldenses and the Vaudois, they saw that they had been true to what they now discovered. They thought they were discovering for the first time what had been in the scriptures, what they called the five principles of the Reformation. But these were the same principles that the Vaudois held and that the Paulicians held and that the men and women had held when they were tortured from 1203 to 1808, those 605 years of brutal torture and death, those believers knew that the authority was scripture alone, that is the graciousness of our God to save us, grace alone. That faith is a gift of God by which we come in contact with the gospel. It is the conduit or means by which we trust on Christ alone. And that our salvation is in him. They were emphatic that salvation was in the person of Christ Jesus. And they gave praise and glory unto the Lord. It is just wonderful to see that they saw the brethren. It is wonderful to see some of the children of these times, of the, the early believers and of the Reformation, who could not only quote scripture, but could give you those five biblical principles. Children who not only could say grace alone, faith alone, and on scripture alone, but they could give you the prepositions. It's on the authority of scripture alone. It's by grace alone. It's through faith alone. It's in Christ Jesus alone. And it's to God only be the glory. The prepositions. So that young people could not only tell you the five principles of the Reformation, but they could give you distinctively, correctly, the prepositions that emphatically teach what the early believers held to and what the Reformation was to discover again and what's on the pages of Scripture. Why the Paulinus called themselves Paulinus? Because they were true to the Apostle Paul. And so this is the, the teachings that were emphatic in those days and which were really distinctive. 
It is really horrendous and it breaks my heart to say it. I've done a tremendous amount of research and reading on the Vaudois, the Waldenses, and to see how true they were to biblical faith through most horrific sufferings. It wasn't until the 20th century that the Vaudois, the Waldenses, ceased to be biblical Christians. They caved in in what we knew as the false ecumenism of the 20th century. There are now in Italy still churches that call themselves Waldensian church, but they do not know their history and they do not know the true gospel. It would break your heart that what withstood armies, torture, and brutal punishment over centuries finally caved in to the subtlety and evil of the 20th century before we had the 21st century. It is horrendous. And this was before we had evangelicals and Catholics together. We had such people as Billy Graham, you know, going to see Cardinal Cushing in Chicago, visiting the Pope, and having priests and nuns as counselors at his crusades, and other famous evangelicals bowing the knee to papal Rome. Finally, the Vaudois give in to papal Rome and accept it and give up their true gospel in the 20th century. It teaches you who are alive today and truly Christian that you must contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. It is for you to give the gospel and to be true to the gospel of God's grace because that is what it all stands for. And to stand with a zeal that you not only know the scriptures, but that you have an urgency to give that gospel. When you go out to a restaurant, do you give the gospel to the waitress? When you go to a supermarket and you're coming out at the checkout counter, do you ask the checker what is your goal in life? That's my usual question. And they say, well, I have another job and I'm trying to go to I have this job and I'm trying to go to college. I want to settle down and get married. What is your goal before the all-holy God? Interesting. You can give the gospel even in the express lane <laughs> at the supermarket. Interesting. Here on the East Coast, like on the West Coast, it's particularly important to witness at banks. They're taught customer service, and they must be kind to you and nice to you. <laughs> and you can give them. It's interesting because it's often first time, it's first time job, and you find people from European countries who speak English as their second language. And you can start witnessing with other languages. I know I've found that on the West Coast. You start bringing other tracks and other languages to the bank. When you see somebody saved at the bank, know that you've been like the early believers. <laughs> or when you see somebody saved, like your hairdresser, have you ever witnessed to your hairdresser? Have you ever witnessed to the UPS man? He's one of the hardest people to witness to. But this is whether we're true to the gospel. You young people, when you go out at school, you find that you have Catholic friends at school. Do you witness to them? Or Greek Orthodox, which are quite similar to Catholicism. Do you give the gospel? Are we true to the Lord? Do we have a love? Are we willing to share that? 
It is not simply that we have commandments, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not steal. We have the great commandment or the great commission, go ye and give the gospel to all creation. And that starts in our daily evangelism. And that's where we see really churches grow as people come in who are saved from everyday life. I believe that men should go out door to door. It's something I've done myself. And I have done some street witnessing. But the witnessing is for all men, women, and children in our daily lives that we give witness to the gospel of God's grace. And does anybody here tonight as a visitor who maybe you are Catholic or maybe you just came out of interest and you don't know Christ Jesus, I would say to you what Christ Jesus himself said when he was asked by the Jews, what must we do that we may do the work of God? They want to know how to be good people. What good things must we do? And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It was God's work already done that you trust on him. That is, Christ was speaking about himself whom whom God had sent. You trust on him, his finished sacrifice and perfect life. I'm happy with my sacraments. That's all I know. That's what my grandparents knew. That's all I've ever known. Well, you're just like the Pharisees. And Christ Jesus looked them in the eye and he said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. Straightforward evangelism. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. That's true for everybody here who knows not Christ. If you do not believe in Christ Jesus, his perfect life, his perfect finished work, you will die in your sins and pay for all eternity for those sins, separated from God in hell. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. And that is the straightforward message given here tonight. And we trust that as any person here that knows not Christ, that they would Look unto him as he gives his grace and trust on him and him alone. We truly praise God for the early believers and we truly praise God for the authentic early church and that we can know them and know what they stood for. And we pray that we may be like them. And as many of them had memorized scripture that like unto them, we could say the words of the apostle, that we are accepted in the beloved to the praise of the glory of his grace. And that's our final note. We give praise, glory, worship, and honor to him now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Praise God. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.